when you look for a partner, a lover, and a lifelong spouse, one can only hope for respect, protection, and unconditional love. However, there are times where you'll meet someone who may act kind and loving, but underneath the facade is ill intent, looking for ways that a relationship can benefit them. In this case, money was a deadly motive. Here are their stories. Paul and Linda Curry. Southern California, Linda Curry was initially hired as a secretary at Edison San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. She eventually climbed up the ladder and worked her way into management. Then, in 1989, Paul Curry was hired to train engineers at the plant. That was when they met and eventually began dating. At the time, Linda was 45 and Paul was only 32. Apparently, Paul was incredibly bright, and his intelligence quickly caught Linda's eye. In fact, it was widely known that Paul was a two-time Jeopardy winner and a Mensa member. Then, on September 12, 1992, Linda and Paul married in Las Vegas and moved into a home that Linda had bought in San Clemente, California. Even though Linda and Paul had married and moved in together, it was known among Linda's friends, including her best friend Mary Siebold, that there is zero passion in their marriage, even specifying that Paul seemed to have no interest in having sex with her. A month after their wedding, Linda told her best friend Mary that Paul was urging her to obtain a $1 million life insurance policy, wanting her to specify him as the beneficiary. Upon her friend's disagreements, Linda never got the extra policy, but unfortunately, Linda already had multiple life insurance policies worth around the same amount, which Paul was assigned as the beneficiary. Linda's friends began to worry more and more. This included Linda's friend and ex-boyfriend, Bill Sandretto, who just happened to be a life insurance salesman. Bill begged her numerous times to move out of the house that she shared with Paul, and he also convinced Linda to change the beneficiary on some of her life insurance policies from Paul to her sister. Bill told her, get him off. You need to change your life policy right away. Linda tried to assign Bill as a beneficiary, but Bill declined and said, no, don't give it to me, give it to your sister. Linda was very torn. That's when she asked her friend and coworker, Frankie Thurber, to move in. Frankie recalls her saying, Frankie, would you do me a favor? Would you watch Paul and see if you think he's genuine with me and that he really cares about me? Frankie agreed. While Frankie was living in the Curry household, she then saw the opposite of what everyone was saying and thought that Paul was a doting husband because he would do things such as draw Linda a bath or prepare exotic salad dressings for her. Frankie eventually told Linda, Linda, I watched everything. I don't see it. He dotes over you. He loves you. He can't do enough for you. I don't know why you would be questioning that. Then, not even after a year of being wed, Linda became ill with gastrointestinal problems. On July of 1993, she was rushed to the Samaritan Hospital. It was dubbed a mystery illness, and Linda said, I just don't feel well. I just don't feel like myself. She continued to get violently ill to a point that her friends remember seeing her look like an 80-year-old woman due to her failing organs. Registered nurse at the Samaritan Hospital said that, and I quote, Linda Curry came in with gastrointestinal problems, and I was assigned to take care of her that evening. She felt nauseated. She had some vomiting, so I decided to check her IV. There was an overhead light above the IV, so you can see the IV bag clearly. The nurse immediately was concerned because the IV bag was very, very cloudy, and that was unusual. She knew something was just not right. She reported the incident to the hospital and authorities, where the IV bag was sent to the lab for testing. The hospital was not sure the cause of Linda's illness, but poisoning was suspected. Linda was hospitalized for 21 days and had a stroke during her stay, where she almost died. When the results of the contaminated bag came back, they found that lidocaine was in her IV. This was also reported to the police. 
And that was when the investigation into Paul started. The police began interviewing Linda and recorded their conversation. The detective said, Paul is your husband? Uh-huh, Linda said. And how long have you been married? Not quite a year. Then they zeroed in on the key question, which was, if somebody were trying to do something to you, if they were trying to poison you, any idea who would try to do that? Linda responded with, well, the only person I could think of that would have a motive to do it would be Paul. And the only motive I can think of is money, but I don't even really want to believe that or think that. Linda was candid with detectives, admitting that her new husband was sneaky about money issues and had lied about his past marriages and children. But still, there was one very big but. The detective asked, do you still love Paul? Linda responded with, yes, I love him very, very much. The detective responded with, do you believe he loves you? Linda replied, I want to believe he does. He certainly is convincing. Linda was still conflicted, so after she recovered, she decided to stay with Paul. An investigation fizzled until the mysterious illness returned later that December of 1993. This time, Paul went out of his way to take Linda to a different hospital in Mission Viejo. And sure enough, Linda's IV was tampered with once again. Linda's best friend Mary Siebold was very concerned. Mary said she looked like she was for sure going to die. And meanwhile, Paul was acting very caring and involved. When Linda's IV was tampered again, an alarm went off in the hospital shortly after Paul leaving her bedroom. A nurse at the hospital witnessed as he scurried out of the room. The hospital decided that they were going to put up a sign on Linda's door. Linda's friend Mary recalled the note that read, Mr. Curry, or Linda's husband, is not allowed unaccompanied into this hospital room. The incident was reported to the authorities and the investigation was kickstarted again. They decided to do another interview while Linda was still at the hospital. Linda told cops that Paul was running up high credit card bills, but was not too bothered by it, even stating, he's a wonderful man, I love him and he's always been good to me. The next day, detectives interviewed Paul Curry, but he remained with his original story of not knowing what was going on with his wife's illness. In the interview, he said, I was completely befuddled when doctors couldn't solve the problem, and I couldn't solve the problem. All the while this was happening, Mary went to the house of Paul and Linda Curry, where she went into their bedroom and found a bunch of papers scattered across their dressers, and those paperwork were all life insurance related. There was even a gold writing with a circle around it that said life insurance. Mary recalled thinking that these were all red flags, because Linda was still in the hospital. So she confronted Linda with what she had found immediately after Linda was released. Mary asked Linda, did you take all these paperwork out, Linda? Is this something that you were looking for specifically? Linda replied with, no, not at all. Mary continued to beg her to put the pieces together. Eventually, Linda agreed and said, you know what, you're right. There's something going on and I need to get out of here. Then only a day later, Linda backpedaled and said, no, Mary, no. I just can't, I can't leave Paul. Six months went on, and then on June 9, 1994, Mary Siebold received a letter in the form of an email from Paul. Mary said it was odd because it was the first email he's ever sent her. Paul wrote in his email about how concerned he was about Linda's health, and he went on further saying that she was feeling worse than ever before. Then suddenly, later around that same night, around midnight, Paul called 911 telling them that he woke up to find that his wife had stopped breathing. Linda was rushed to the Samaritan Hospital where they pronounced her dead. The initial nurse, Nurse Bundy, who initially found the contaminated IV, heard of the news when she reported to work the next day and she remembered saying to herself, he finally did it. One of the first to hear Linda's death was Paul's boss and good friend, Mike Flower. He received a call at around 1 a.m. that morning and was asked to come to the home of Linda and Paul Curry. He rushed to their home and on the way there, he remembered thinking that she might have passed because of that mysterious illness. At the home, Paul appeared emotional and cried on Mike's shoulder for hours. Mike remembered him stating, I can't believe she is gone. The following day, Linda's ex, Bill, and her friend Frankie heard the news with both being in complete shock. During the autopsy, the medical examiner found a mark behind Linda's ear that was unusual. 
similar to what could look like have been left by a syringe. A toxicology test was performed, and the reports revealed that in Linda's system was a high amount of sleeping medication, as well as a severely high levels of nicotine. The weird part about this was that neither Linda nor Paul were smokers, so it was odd for that amount of nicotine or any amount of nicotine at all to be inside her system. She died from a massive nicotine poisoning. The sleeping medication that was found in her system was the generic form of Ambien, but it was too much of an amount. The examiner therefore declared her death as a homicide. Unfortunately, no form of Ambien or syringe were found in Paul's possession or in his home, so they were unable to move forward with the charge. Around this time, Paul was telling people that he was going to get a million dollars out of this, and that was his plan. But he later found that Linda had written a note giving her sister half of her entire estate. When he found this out, Paul became very irate. He called Mary stuttering, asking her if she had known anything about Linda changing her estate beneficiary. In the note left with her estate, Linda stated, and I quote, he'll be okay, specifying that she left him half of the money and her home. To the very end, Linda remained faithful and loyal to Paul despite her suspicions. After Linda's death, Paul was transferred from his old position at the nuclear power plant to another location, prompting a routine security check to be performed. They found that Paul lied about everything on his resume, and he even lied about his degrees. The so-called brilliant Mensa member who trained nuclear engineers was a fraud. So Mike Flower called Paul and stated, Paul, I'm coming in tomorrow morning at 8 a.m and I'm going to fire you unless your resignation is on my fax. The next morning, Mike arrived at the plant, and his resignation was on his fax. Since Linda divided her estate between two beneficiaries, her sister and Paul, Paul was only able to collect $419,000 from two of the life insurance policies. He also received $564 per month from her retirement plan. Even with all this money, Paul abandoned Linda's home and let it go into foreclosure. Many people were very suspicious of this, but due to the lack of evidence, the case stalled for many years until the year of 2002. In 2002, Sergeant Yvonne Scholl from the Orange County Sheriff's Department reviewed the case and decided to examine all the evidence and re-interview all of the witnesses. In one of the old police interview recordings, Sergeant Yvonne Scholl was able to find the interview that the detective had with Linda Curry where she mentioned that Paul would be the only person to have that motive. And that's when Sergeant Yvonne Scholl focused on Paul. After the initial interview with Paul, Sergeant Scholl began digging into Paul's background and just about everything about him was fake. She enlisted the help of Detective Mike Thompson, whose specialty was following money trails. Detective Thompson combed through all of Linda's insurance claims, including one that was filed by Paul just days after Linda died. In the insurance claim, he stated that someone stole Linda's 18 karat gold ladies presidential Rolex, along with other jewelry. He collected $9,000 from that claim alone. The more that Detective Thompson reviewed the case, the more convinced he became of Paul Curry's intent. Detective Thompson stated, and I quote, This isn't an accident. This isn't an oops. It's not a suicide. It is a homicide. He may sound like a loving husband to his wife, saying things like, Oh honey, I'm sorry you're so sick. But in the back of his mind, he's probably thinking, how is she not dead? How much of this nicotine do I have to give her to kill her? Four years later, after Sergeant Scholl began reinvestigating the case, she felt like she had enough to take it to prosecutor Ibrahim Beatty. She recalled saying, you know, I have this cold case that I've been working on. And Beatty responded, bring me the file. And just a few hours later, Sergeant Scholl arrives with about 25 binders. Prosecutor Ibrahim Beatty studied the case for three years until 2009, when he reached out to a nicotine expert, Dr. Neil Benowitz, who had been hired for the past years to analyze Linda's blood. Dr. Neil Benowitz, a professor of medicine at UCSF, is one of the country's top experts on nicotine. He was asked, how often have you seen nicotine used as a murder weapon? Dr. Benowitz replied, never. I've read about it, but I've never seen it until now. He continued to say that, this was beyond anything we've ever measured. Levels four or five times higher than anything we've ever seen before. The detective asked, how do you believe she had to have gotten that nicotine? Dr. Benowitz responded with, well, I think most likely it was an intravenous injection. He replied, it's the only possible explanation, says Dr. Benowitz. 
And remember, the medical examiner did find a puncture mark behind Linda's right ear. The detective asked Dr. Benowitz. The detective asked, Can you say how soon she had to die after she got that dose of nicotine? The doctor responded with, It was my thought that death must have been within 20 to 30 minutes afterwards. However, Dr. Benowitz also said that he does not remember discussing the time frame with the original investigators 20 years ago. But now, says Prosecutor Beatty, that one fact turns the entire case. The nicotine was introduced into Linda's system during this time frame, and the only other human being who had access to her was Paul Curry. According to the prosecutor, this is how he believed it had happened. Linda came home, and Paul introduces Ambien into her system somehow, by food, drink, or his exotic dressing. Then, when she passed out, he takes a full syringe of nicotine and injects it behind her ear. Many asked where Paul could access that much nicotine. And according to Dr. Benowitz, you can actually go to the local store and pick up a pack of cigarettes. He stated that a pack contained 300 milligrams, which is above the lethal dose. The case against Paul was gaining traction, but they needed more. Sergeant Event Shaw went to Salina, Kansas, where Paul was living with his new wife, sons, and new life. However, they decided to try and hide the fact that they were from Orange County. So Prosecutor Beatty came up with a plan where Sergeant Shaw and him would pretend to be local detectives who had no knowledge of the case and was just getting more information from the Orange County Police Department to close out Linda's death investigation. The chief of police in Salina, Kansas actually told Shoal that Paul was a building inspector and was incredibly smart so he won't talk to you. Sergeant Shoal and Beatty was flabbergasted at this statement but proceeded. This is how their interview went. The night that Linda passed away, you and Linda were alone, correct? Right, says Paul. Was there anybody else in the house? Paul replied, no. Sergeant Scholl is locking Paul into the story that he told all these years, leaving him no room to back away from it later. Sergeant asked again, so nobody snuck into the house. There was no burglary in the house. There was no robbery at all, nothing like that. Paul replied with no, no, no. Sergeant Scholl then confirmed, so it was just you and Linda. Paul replied with yes. He has now boxed himself in and gave Sergeant Scholl the opportunity to be direct. And she said, Paul, I believe that the cause of Linda's illnesses and the cause of Linda's death are at your hands. And before I ask you any other questions, I feel like I need to read you your rights. Paul responded, are you arresting me? Sergeant Scholl asked, were you slowly poisoning her? And Paul said no. Despite the grilling, a detached Paul seemed to have other things in his mind and when Sergeant Scholl leaves the room, Paul shows his impatience. Paul asks the other detectives, should I presume that I'm not going to make my four o'clock meeting today? In a frustrated manner. The local detective said yes. Paul continued to ask why, and they responded, I don't know how long this is gonna take. Paul's frustration began to build. Well, what is it? What is it that is taking so long? Does this trump my obligation to my employer? This is going to be awfully hard to explain professionally. That's the least of Paul's worries. Sergeant Scholl comes back in and says, at this point, Paul, you are not free to leave. I'm placing you under arrest for the murder of Linda Curry. My name is Yvonne Scholl and my middle name is Marie. 16 years after Linda's death, Paul Curry was finally arrested for her murder. Sergeant Shaw stated that it felt good to pull out her badge, ID, and introduce herself as being from Orange County and that she was going to arrest him. In September 2014, Assistant District Attorney Abraham Beatty finally has Paul in the seat to question him in front of a jury for the murder of his wife. Paul in his defense pointed out that there is a lack of evidence, there is no sleeping pills found, and there was no syringe found. Going further to state that the case was based on suspicion, innuendo, and conjecture. That Linda was desperate for a cure and that she gave herself a nicotine enema, killing herself. Beatty fought back saying there is no evidence of an enema, and it did not explain the toxic levels of Ambien in her system. Beatty said that there is no prescription or evidence found that Paul obtained Ambien, but Linda died that night within 30 minutes of getting that one lethal dose and Paul was the only one that could have done it, stating, and I quote, nobody other than the defendant had access to Linda for six hours before the murder. Now Paul never takes a stand, but Beatty did have a recording of Paul talking to his wife using the jailhouse phone. Prosecutor Beatty said to the court, 
One of the better witnesses that I had is the one that I wasn't able to get on the stand, which was Paul Curry himself. Because the day after I signed that piece of paper to get him arrested and he was in custody, he talks to his current wife on the phone. And while on the phone, you can hear him telling her about what he thinks about the evidence. And this is what the recording said. Paul says, hey, I'm in trouble. I'm under arrest, I'm in jail. His wife, Teresa, responded, tell me what's going on, I don't understand. Paul continues to say, I'm in big trouble. I gotta tell you, it looks bad. I mean, other than the fact that there's no physical evidence that I did it and I didn't do it, they could put me away to prison. They're serious about this. The jurors deliberated for a day and a half and reached a verdict. Mary and her friends was there holding tight to Linda's earrings as they waited for the announcement. The verdict? Paul Curry was found guilty of murder for financial gain. And immediately, Sergeant Scholl, Prosecutor Beatty, family and friends felt peace. Though they wished it had happened earlier, they are happy to have him charged with what he deserved. At this moment, Paul is remaining his innocence and is currently appealing his conviction. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Also, if you guys have any input about this particular story, please let me know below. I really want to know what you guys think about this particular case, if you think he's innocent, or if you do indeed think he's guilty. Also, if you are single and dating out there, please, please be careful. Trust your gut, your friends, and your family, and maybe do a background check just to make sure that they're okay. All right, 